In the first video, Learn Go in 12 minutes, we had a very quick look at the main features of the language, so you could get going straight away. One thing I didn't talk about though was the support for concurrency that Go has. This is a really big part of Go, it's a big selling point and a reason why a lot of people choose the language, so I thought it deserved its own video. It's worth understanding that concurrency is not quite the same as parallelism. To run things in parallel means to run two things at exactly the same time. This is what happens on a multi-core processor. So you have one core doing one thing and another core doing a different thing, both simultaneously. Typically though, the lines of code that make up a program have to run in the right order, which makes it hard to parallelize and execute two lines at the same time. So concurrency is about breaking up a program into independently executing tasks that could potentially run at the same time and still getting the right result at the end. So a concurrent program is one that can be parallelized. We're not going to concern ourselves uh, with what is happening at the CPU level and whether something is running on multiple cores or not. The Go runtime and the operating system will take care of it for us. We can concentrate on the structure of our program and using the tools that Go gives us to make our code concurrent. So, I've got a text editor. Uh, I'm going to write a really simple function called count. It's going to take a string as an argument and in an infinite for loop that starts at one and just loops forever counting up. I'm going to output the, the number that we're at and the string that we passed in. And then I'm just going to sleep for half a second. And I can count sheep and then I'll make a call to count fish afterwards. So this is a synchronous program, there's no concurrency here. It's going to execute the, the count function and it's going to wait for it to finish before moving on to the next line. But the count function never finishes, so it's just going to count sheep forever and never get to the fish. So I'll just do that until I kill it. If, however, we call the function with the word go in front of it, it won't wait for it to finish before moving on to the next line. It'll say, go and run this function in the background and then continue to the next line immediately. And this creates what is called a go routine. And that go routine will run concurrently. So we now actually have two go routines. The main function with the, the main execution path of the program is a go routine. And now this new one that we've created explicitly. So these will both run side by side, and we see now it counts fish and it counts sheep. Go routines are very efficient. It's okay to make tens, hundreds, even thousands of Go routines. But bear in mind that you can't make a program infinitely fast by adding more and more concurrent Go routines, because ultimately you are constrained by how many calls that your CPU has. I'm going to make one tiny change to this program and run both count functions as Go routines. Now you might expect this to do exactly the same as before, and you'd be almost right, but we get a very different result. We don't get anything. So what has happened? Well, in Go, when the main Go routine finishes, the program exits, regardless of what any other Go routines might be doing. Previously, the main Go routine never finished because it would have this infinite for loop in it. But now we've pushed that loop into its own Go routine, so the main function will continue immediately to the next line. But there are no more lines of code, uh, so it's done and the program terminates. And the Go routines that we've created ourselves haven't had time to do anything. If we were to sleep, for two seconds here. You'll see it now outputs for two seconds and then it terminates. You'll often see people add a call to fmt.scanline at the end of the main function to fix this problem. Uh, and this will stop the main function from immediately terminating because it'll wait. This is a blocking call. It'll wait for user input. So this gives our Go routines time to execute and it's gonna keep doing this until I press enter. And at that point, it'll move on and the, the main function will finish and the program will exit again. In reality though, this is not a very useful solution because it does require manual user input. What we can do instead is use a wait group. I'm going to import the sync package from the standard library. And let's just alter our program so we have uh, one call to count. And let's just count up to five. To use a wait group, I'm first going to create one. And it's nothing scary, it's just a counter. And I'm going to increment it by one to say that I have one goal routine to wait for. And it doesn't do any magic here, it's up to me to increment it. The next step is to decrement the counter when the goal routine finishes. So after this for loop, I want to decrement the counter. Now I could pass a pointer to the wait group 
to the count function, but I don't think it's really the responsibility of count to deal with this. So instead, I'm going to wrap the call to count in an anonymous function. This syntax creates a function and then immediately invokes it. So this will still run as a go routine, and inside here, I'm going to call count again. And then afterwards, I'm going to call wg.done. Since we've created this function inline, we have access to that wg variable, which is convenient. And done literally just decrements the counter by one. So all we have so far is a counter of how many go routines are running. The useful bit now is to call wait at the end of the main function. This will block until the counter is zero. So if any go routines haven't finished, it'll wait. So now it's going to count to five. Count will return. We'll call done, which will decrement the counter. And then this wait will be like, oh, the counter's at zero and allow the code to continue and the program terminates. Really easy to use. So that's how to create a go routine. Really simple, but not massively useful so far. What we need next are channels. A channel is a way for go routines to communicate with each other. So far, the count function has just been outputting directly to the terminal. But what if we wanted to communicate back to the main go routine? Well, we can accept a channel as an argument. And it's like a pipe through which you can send a message or receive a message. Channels have a type as well, so this one will be a string channel and will only be able to pass messages that are strings. Any type works though, uh, you can even send channels through channels. So instead of outputting thing to the terminal, I'm going to use this arrow syntax to send the value of thing over the channel. So an arrow pointing in to the channel name will send a message. Gonna get rid of the wait group stuff now. So a nice simple uh, concurrent call to count. And now we need to pass the channel in. So first we can make one using the make function. Pass that to count. And then we can use an arrow coming out of the channel name to receive a message from the channel. So this is gonna receive one message, uh, output sheep once and then terminate. And it's important to understand that sending and receiving are blocking operations. When you try to receive something, you have to wait for there to be a value there to receive. Similarly, when you're sending a message, it'll wait until a receiver is ready to receive. So you can see it does what we expect, it outputs cheap. And this blocking nature of channels allows us to use them to synchronize go routines. Imagine you have two independent go routines. Each line here is a line of code. We don't really care what it is except down here, we receive on a channel. And over in this go routine, we send on the channel. When they both execute, sometimes one will stop and start and the other will stop and start. They might be executing different code. They won't stay synchronized at all. But when this go routine on the left tries to receive on the channel, it'll stop and wait until something is sent. And at some point, the other go routine will reach the line where it tries to send and then they'll be able to communicate through this channel. So at this precise moment, they're both at this communication point. So we're communicating and we're synchronizing, which is an important concept. Back to the code. Uh, this just receives one message. If we wanted to receive all of them, then we could wrap this in a for loop. So this does what we expect, but then it gets a fatal error. We get deadlock. This is because the count function is finished, but the main function is still waiting to receive on the channel, but nothing else is ever going to send a message on the channel, so it'll be waiting forever. The program will never terminate. Go is able to detect this problem at runtime, not at compile time. It hasn't solved the halting problem, but when it actually happens, it can see that Go routines aren't making any progress. To solve this, we can close the channel. As a sender, if we're finished sending and we don't need the channel anymore, we can close it. If you are the receiver, you shouldn't ever close a channel because you don't know whether the sender is finished or not. If you close the channel prematurely and then the sender tries to send on that closed channel, it'll cause an error, it'll panic. But it's okay for the count function here to close the channel because it knows that it's done and it's not going to use it anymore. When we receive on the channel, we can actually receive a second value which tells us whether the channel is still open. If it's not open, if it's been closed, then we can break out of this for loop. So now we don't get the, the deadlock anymore. And there's actually a slightly nicer way we can do this in Go by iterating over the range of a channel. So this will keep receiving messages and putting the value into this message variable here until the channel is closed. 
So then we don't need to manually check that it's closed anymore. Exactly the same result. Just a bit of syntactic sugar. So we've seen so far that sending to a channel is a blocking operation. To demonstrate the constraints of this, I'm going to do something really simple. I'm going to make a channel of strings. I'm going to send hello across the channel. And then I'm going to try to receive from the channel and output it to the terminal. Naively, we might expect this to work and just output the word hello, but we're actually going to get deadlock again. This is because the send will block until something is ready to receive, but the code never progresses to the receive line because we're blocked at send. To make this work, we'd need to receive in a separate go routine. Alternatively, we can make a buffered channel by giving a capacity when we make the channel. You can fill up a buffered channel without a corresponding receiver and it won't block until the channel is full. So with a capacity of two, this will work and it'll output hello. We can even put two things into the channel before having to read anything back out. So we put two things in and then we read them uh, and nothing blocks here. If we try to send a third time though, the channel's going to be full, uh, so that call will actually block and will get deadlock again. The final construct that Go has is the select statement. If I have two Go routines, I'll just create them in line like this. I'm going to make two channels uh, which will send and receive strings. The first Go routine is going to send on the first channel. And it's going to be ready to send every 500 milliseconds. So I'm just going to add a sleep here for half a second. The second go routine is going to send on the second channel. And it's going to do that every two seconds. And of course, to make it do this infinitely, I'm going to wrap each one in a for loop. Back in the main go routine, uh, I could similarly have an infinite for loop. And I could receive from channel one. and I could receive from channel two and then loop and do that over and over again. But we'll always get one and then the other and then one and then the other, even though this first go routine is ready to send much sooner. Uh, and this is because we're gonna block each time waiting for the slow one. So every time we try to receive from channel two, we're gonna have to wait two seconds. So it's really slowing down this first go routine. Instead, we could use a select statement, which allows us to receive from whichever channel is ready. So in the case that channel one has a message, we can output that. But in the case that channel two has a message, sorry, that should be uh, message one. In the case that channel two has a message, then we can output message two. And then we're just gonna loop over this. So this time we see that we're able to receive a lot more quickly from channel one because this is only sleeping for half a second and that select statement will keep picking channel one because it's available. Finally, I want to demonstrate a common pattern called worker pools. This is where you have a queue of work to be done and multiple concurrent workers pulling items off the queue. I'm going to write a really simple Fibonacci algorithm. It's going to calculate the nth Fibonacci number and return it. So if n is 0 or 1, then just return n. Otherwise, return the sum of the previous two Fibonacci numbers. I'm then going to write a worker which takes two channels, one channel of jobs to do, and one channel to send results on. Instead of specifying bidirectional channels, we can actually say that we'll only ever receive from the jobs channel and will only ever send on the results channel. And this just reduces the chance of bugs because now if we tried to send on the jobs channel, we'd get a compile time error. So jobs is gonna be a queue of numbers. And we're gonna use the range feature to consume items from this queue. So it's just gonna receive on the jobs channel. So we're gonna receive n from the channel. We're then gonna calculate the nth Fibonacci number and send it on the results channel. In the main function, uh, obviously create the two channels. I'm going to make them buffered channels and, and give them a size of 100. No particular reason why I'm picking 100, it's just a nice round number. I'm then going to create a worker as a concurrent go routine. 
give it the, the two channels that it needs. I'm then going to fill up the jobs channel with 100 numbers. So we're just going to iterate from 0 to 99 and put all of those numbers on this jobs channel. And since it's buffered, we're not going to block. That's going to be fine. Once they're on there, the worker will concurrently start pulling one off at a time and calculating the, the Fibonacci number and then putting it back onto the results channel. I'm going to close jobs because we're finished putting stuff onto that channel now. We have a sender here, so it's okay to close it. I then expect 100 items to eventually appear on the results channel. Uh, so that's going to be the first 100 Fibonacci numbers. So I'm just going to receive each one of those and output it to the terminal. So this works, this is fine. It does the first batch really quickly and it's going to get progressively slower. It's quite an inefficient algorithm. And if we look in Activity Monitor, it's almost maxing out the CPU. It's very close to 100%, trying its best to calculate each Fibonacci number as the worker pulls one off the jobs queue. So that's cool. Um, but what we can do now is add more workers. So I can just copy this line. So now we have four concurrent workers all pulling items off the jobs queue and then all pushing back onto the results queue at the end. And if we look in Activity Monitor now, it's using almost 400% CPU because it's using multiple cores. So the work will get done faster. Like I said at the beginning, I don't want to get too involved with how this works and how much faster it makes things because you don't get a massive amount of control over it. But it is pretty cool to see that we're taking advantage of the multi-core processor. Obviously, this version doesn't guarantee that the Fibonacci numbers will come out in order, but that's the, the gist of how worker pools work. And that is a quick tour of concurrency in Go. Really easy to do. Hopefully, it wasn't too difficult to understand. If you're interested in a career in software development or you just want to improve your skills, then you might find it useful to dive further into computer science. There's a lot more to computer science than just programming. It's a very broad field and it covers maths uh, with topics like linear algebra, probability. It covers hardware, which goes all the way down to how the CPU works. Algorithms like this Fibonacci algorithm that I wrote uh, and you'd learn how to analyze the efficiency and how to write better versions, which don't max out your CPU usage. So having an understanding of these topics uh, really helps when you're writing code. It can greatly simplify coding projects. Brilliant.org is a great place to learn more about computer science. They offer curated courses on many things, from the fundamentals all the way up to cool stuff like artificial neural networks. The guided courses go into great detail to build up your knowledge and then walk you through various problems to help you practice and really understand what you're learning. Understanding how memory works, for example, is going to help you write more efficient code and it'll help you reason about the code because you'll understand what's happening at the operating system and the CPU level. Pointers in Go will suddenly make a lot more sense. If this sounds interesting, go to brilliant.org slash jakewright. The link is in the description. You can sign up for free, uh, but the first 200 people who go to that link will get 20% off the annual premium subscription. If you found this video useful, click the like button, hit subscribe if you want to see more tutorials like this one, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.